Yeah, wasn't that amazing? Let's give some love to Scott Paulson on Foley Music and Sound, creating the soundscape, creating the atmosphere, creating the vibe for what we are about to witness here this evening. Thank you all so much for joining us for Listen With The Lights Off, The Gore. Much more to come. Hi, my name is Jacole Kitchen. I am the newly appointed. Oh, crap, hold on. I always forget it. It's so new. I even wrote it down so I would say it right. Okay, <clears throat> let me start that over. Hi, everybody. I'm Jacole Kitchen, the newly appointed Director of Arts Engagement and In-House Casting at La Jolla Playhouse. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all here today for Listen With The Lights Off, The Gourd. Um, so Say We All is a longtime partner of La Jolla Playhouse, going back to their participation in a number of WOW festivals. And they have also been an integral part of the creation and continuation of our veterans playwriting workshop that we were able to continue virtually during the pandemic, uh, which took us into the fourth cohort of the veterans playwriting workshop. And that wouldn't have been able to continue without the work of So Say We All and uh, their various veterans programs. They have also been um, very, very supportive and a huge part of a lot of the veterans programs that we have uh, been running here at La Jolla Playhouse. They are um, extremely deep-rooted in this community. They have been a powerhouse in this community for more than two decades. So Say We All is um, an organization that creates opportunities for storytellers of all kinds to tell better stories and give them platforms to be able to do so. Uh, in addition to their many, many uh, public programs. So Say We All also runs a number of education and outreach programs, again, for storytellers of all ages, of all sorts. Um, 
really, really fantastic organization. We are so blessed here at La Jolla Playhouse to have been able to partner with them on so many projects, including Listen With The Lights Off for our digital WOW series. For those of you who are watching this program on YouTube, which I believe is a number of you, please take a moment to uh, click to subscribe. I think that there is a link right below me where you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, that's where you can see a lot more events just like this, more of our digital wow series. You can also catch uh, our conversation series, uh, Coffee with the Playhouse, which is a monthly conversation uh, with Christopher Ashley and lots of different theater makers within our community and our extended La Jolla Playhouse community. Um, and also where you can find We Are Listening, a bi-weekly conversation with Black theater artists co-hosted by yours truly. This is a partnership with La Jolla Playhouse, The Old Globe, and the program originated at San Diego Rep, which we are so happy that they invited us to be a part of. But this, what we are here for tonight is Listen With The Lights Off, a So Say We All production in partnership with the Hoya Playhouse's Digital Wow series. So let's bring the creators uh, of this program and the two people who are responsible for just about everything you see at So Say We All, Executive Director Justin Hutnall and Programs Director Jennifer Corley. Thank you so much for partnering with us. Welcome, Justin and Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Newly appointed Director Jacola. congratulations. We love to hear that. Uh, if there was any ambiguity, I'm Justin Hudnall. And I'm Jennifer Corley. And uh, welcome everybody watching to the listening party for episode four of Listen With The Lights Off. If you're new to our program, uh, Listen With The Lights Off was developed for the La Jolla Playhouse's 2020 Digital Without Walls Festival. And it allows us to bring stories from our line of print published horror anthologies, one of which I happen to have right here, to the radio and podcast. We work with an incredible cast of actors and uh, some of whom you're going to get to meet after at the end of today's episode. So please stick around till the very end. And we have all live Foley sound effects created by Scott Paulson, who you heard from at the top of the episode, just like we had in old timey days. We are so excited to be back with episode four of Listen With The Lights Off and with a special event tonight for a story called The Gourd, as Jacole mentioned. This was written by Jim Ruland, a novelist, and this tale is so amazing. It's weird, it's dark, it's funny, and it's full of personality. In this story, you're gonna meet Trevor, who is a guy who's just trying to live a simple, sober life in LA. And unfortunately, that gets sidetracked when he gets sucked into a sinister and bizarre situation when he's just trying to do a good deed for a friend. Now, something we like to do at our listening parties is create a special drink pairing for you to enjoy at home along with it. And uh, today we'd like to show you how to make a little something we call the engorged gourd. So all you need is a little Midori, you need some rum, and you need equal parts of those. And you're also gonna add as much pineapple juice as you like. If you want to, you can also top it off with a little Sprite or 7-Up. So what you wanna do is put all of these ingredients into a shaker, and then you're gonna give it a little stir. We like to do this the natural way. Then all you do is you pour it in a glass over ice and add a garnish of cucumber, which Jacole recently taught us is the least understood gourd of them all. But everybody deserves some special attention. And there you have it, your engorged gourd. So now all that's left is to have your drink listen to the episode, and remember to please stick around for the Q&A afterwards. The Gourd by Jim Ruland. When Trevor got clean, he lost most of his friends. The worst of those he had left was a mobile phone salesman named Dallas, whose fiance owned a house high up on a hill in Echo Park. Trevor couldn't say whether Dallas, a desperate philanderer and hopeless drunk, actually intended to marry Deborah, but whenever the couple went away together, Trevor watered their garden. Trevor did this for the simple reason that Dallas was his last link to the bad old days, 
which he felt obligated to hang on like a shoebox filled with old postcards. The last time Trevor was roped into watering the garden, Dallas invited him over for dinner, and they all went through the charade of pretending to enjoy each other's company. Deborah clearly didn't think Trevor's sobriety would stick. He hadn't helped his case by bringing over a bottle of Lithuanian liquor that had been given to him by a co-worker as a gag. Apparently, not even the Lithuanians drink the stuff. At the end of the evening, after Dallas had consumed most of the bottle and promptly puked it back up onto his dinner jacket, he slurred, My vomit? It smells like Christmas trees. If Deborah thought she could have gotten away with it, she would have murdered them both on the spot. To be fair, Deborah hated anyone capable of leading her wayward beau astray, which was everyone. This time, when Dallas called to ask Trevor to water the garden, he lingered on the phone, as if there was something more he wanted to ask Trevor and just didn't know how. What's on your mind, Dallas? It's the zucchini. Zucchini? Summer squash. Grows on the ground like a pumpkin. I know what a zucchini is. Well, there was this one time when I trampled Deborah's zucchini that she'd planted without telling me about it. She acted like I stomped on it intentionally. Did you? Maybe. Probably. I don't know. She got what she wanted out of it. Which was? More zucchini. And a sprinkler system. Expensive as fuck. Then what do you need me for? To come over twice a day and make sure the system is online. That's it? But one more thing. Squash grows insanely fast. They start out as flowers, then these little nubs form. Those are the ovaries. Next thing you know, you got a garden full of sex toys. Sounds freaky. We got this one plant that grows a super humongous zucchini that Deb's kind of fixated on. Obsessed, really. But you didn't hear that from me. How, how big? I don't know. Haven't measured it lately. But it's pretty fucking big. Prune it. Talk to it. Give it a little TLC. You want me to talk to your zucchini? You need to keep that sucker alive, Trevor. Because if you don't, I don't know what'll happen to me and Deborah. Because of a zucchini? Well, also because of the tomatoes. And the Mercedes. But what I'm saying is I'm counting on you. Have I ever let you down since I got clean and sober, I mean? No. Do you have any friends more reliable than me? You're my only friend. What do you want me to do with the rest of the zucchini? I don't care. Make some zucchini bread. Have a party. When Trevor was a kid, his grandmother used to bake zucchini bread. She'd get up early and start baking while the house was still cool. It was the first thing he'd smell when he woke up. Rich, sweet, earthy. It was maybe his favorite childhood memory. Where are you going, by the way? Couples retreat. In Paris. Paris? I didn't know you could speak French. I don't. That's the best part. The evening of Dallas's departure, Trevor drove to Echo Park. He planned his trip to coincide with the post-rush hour pre-sunset window, when the palms that lined the streets were dappled with orange light. Young professional types walked their indoor dogs, older women took post-yoga strolls up and down the asphalt slopes, and fertile men smoked on the sidewalks while scrolling through their phones. Trevor was able to take in all these details because there was no place to fucking park. When prowling for a spot, Trevor had something like a flashback. He'd been here before. Back in his grandma day days, back when the nights went by in a flash and the mornings never ended. When the night wound down for the other revelers, Trevor would go back to his dealer, pick up another gram, and keep on rolling. The dealers he frequented always seemed to live in nice houses in the hills, and one of the many that Trevor had cultivated lived somewhere around here. These days, Echo Park had more cars than spots, and Trevor ended up leaving his vehicle in the parking lot of an auto parts store down on the boulevard. He trudged up the hill, setting off a chorus of barking dogs with each house he passed. Stapled to the telephone pole in front of Deborah's house was a pair of lost pet notices, one above the other. Trevor punched in the code, and when the buzzer sounded, he pulled open the gate and went up the short cement steps to a second gate that required a second code. 
which was the inverse of the first, and finally gave him access to the garden. The layout had changed since his last visit, presumably on account of the newly installed sprinkler system. The majority of the garden consisted of desert succulents and drought-friendly species of lavender, rosemary, and sage, white sage, grandmother sage, thunderclap sage, you name it, sage. The plants that required more frequent watering were lined up along the perimeter of the fence. Deborah had the basil, kale, and other herbs and lettuces on one side and the zucchini on the other. Trevor followed the flagstone walk through the hardy succulents and approached the zucchini plants with apprehension. At first glance, he didn't see what all the fuss was about. The plants were big, but not grotesquely so. Just your garden variety zucchini their dusky leaves in stark contrast with the white gravel. Trevor stooped to get a closer look at the plants and was assaulted by the scent of the nutrient-rich soil that Dallas had complained cost as much per pound as he paid per ounce of the high-strained marijuana that he used to mitigate his hangovers. It was not a pleasant smell, but an odor as persistent and pervasive as pond stink. This brought back memories, too. He peered through the foliage, but all he could see were long, dark, crook-necked gourds, undeniably phallic, sprawled in the shadows like drunks. Many of them were topped with spent flowers that resembled used condoms rotting in the dark. He selected a zucchini and ripped it free, the stiff nettles stinging his hands. He tossed it in a basket and moved down the row. The monster zucchini resided in the corner where the two rows of planters came together. It was considerably larger and darker than the rest, and its forest green leaves possessed a purplish tint. Trevor parted the plant's leaves with his hands and spied a squash so big he couldn't see the whole thing, just the portion that pushed through the leaves and twinkled in the fading sunlight like an eye. Although it proved to be just the bulb at the bottom of the plant, Trevor had the distinct impression it was peering back at him. Hi. My name is Trevor, and I will be your caretaker for the next week or so. I am looking forward to this opportunity for you and I to, um, uh, wow, this is, this is so dumb. Talking to a vegetable or fruiting ovary or whatever the hell this is. A whirring sound that Trevor couldn't identify. Helicopter? Leaf blower? Distracted him from his conversation, one-sided though it was. He scanned the skies and saw nothing but the sound intensified until he recognized, too late, what it was. Sprinkler heads rose out of the gravel like submerged sentinels, guardians of the garden, and unleashed a blast of water that sent Trevor scurrying back to his car. When Trevor was a boy... He lived in a subdivision that had been built next to a reclaimed garbage dump. Over a period of years, the dump was converted into a massive, multi-use grass-covered slope with an astounding variety of skull-cracking skate parks and playgrounds called Vista View, but everyone called it Mount Scum. Mount Scum was overrun with Baptist Boy Scouts that Trevor did his best to avoid, preferring instead to haunt the diseased pond on the backside of the old dump. The pond smelled weird and was prone to fish kills and was good for at least one dead dog per summer. It was even rumored that a kid had drowned there, but the details were sketchy. The pond was not nearly as large as a lake, yet sizable enough to have its own tiny island, which was uninhabited and possessed a thicket of cattails around its greasy shores. Trevor spent a great deal of time wondering what went on there, how it came into being. Had it been shaped by the same hands that made a mountain out of trash? Was it possible that no human foot had ever set sneaker there? Did such places exist anymore? Did it even have a name? Trevor was desperate to explore the island, but two things held him back. His father's direct order, You stay the fuck away from that pond! and the astounding ickiness of the pond surface, which was thick with iridescent scum that gleamed in the early morning sunlight, like the carapace of an exotic beetle. He considered building a boat, but that would require the kind of effort that would have made Trevor no different than those Baptist assholes who congregated atop Mount Scum on Saturday mornings, 
flying homemade kites and building cars for the annual soapbox derby. Fuck that. I am exploring this island commando style. One cool morning toward the end of summer vacation, equipped with an aluminum pole purloined from his father's tent, a canvas satchel left over from his days as a newspaper delivery boy, and a mason jar with holes punched in its lid that had once held innumerable grasshoppers, praying mantises, and lightning bugs, all deceased. Trevor entered the muck. The water was colder than he thought it would be, pleasingly so, and less deep than he'd imagined, and his wobbly, tentative steps gave way to bold, discoverer-type strides. Soon the water went over his knees, crept up his thighs, and tickled his nutsack. The next step plunged him waist-deep, and the step after that went up to his armpit. He was prepared to go in up to his neck, no farther, but could already feel the bottom rising under his feet. He was going to make it. The pole was a big help, a steadying influence. Stroke a freaking genius, really. He took his eyes off the pink and purple islets of scum and scoured the beach for a place where he would plant his flag, so to speak, on the virgin land beyond the cattails. And it was at this moment that the muck gave away beneath his feet, completely submerging him. Trevor screamed as he went under, swallowing who knows how many liters of reclaimed garbage water and how many millions of microscopic muck dwellers. He thrashed about, losing his pole, Most terrifying of all was the silty slurb of mud that spilled into the hole and sealed around his foot like a cement boot. Somehow he was able to right himself, regain his footing, and blorped his way out of the scum hole, sacrificing a sneaker in the process. Trevor scrambled up the bank, crashed through the cattails, and arrived on solid ground. The clearing in the center of the island was ringed with cattails in every direction. There was nowhere else to go. He'd made it. There. Trevor found not virgin soil, but a filthy mattress, stained and redolent with rot. As disappointed as he was, there were still spoils to be reaped. Tucked under a corner of the mattress was a plastic bag that contained a wrinkled, musty-smelling pornographic magazine that displayed an alluring, yet confusing, array of genitalia that made Trevor forget all about the tent pole he'd lost in the pond and focus on the one thrusting out of his shorts. Wowzers. This warranted further study, and he stuffed the magazine in his satchel. The other discovery Trevor made on the leeward side of the Isle of Porn, as he would come to think of it many years later, was a shallow puddle teeming with tadpoles that were strikingly similar to the swimmers he'd only just learned about in his beginnings of biology class. Trevor filled his specimen jar with the little wrigglers, hoisted his spoils above his head, and returned home. On his way back, Trevor considered the possibility that he had swallowed a tadpole during his plunge in the pond. If he had indeed swallowed a tadpole, was it possible for it to grow inside of him? To lengthen and sprout legs? Legs that could attach themselves to his innards? Or even scamper around, feeding off the food he ate until the frog was as big and strong as the bulbous, croaking creatures that plopped about the muck like lords? Trevor had no idea. While his dad was heating up the hamburger casserole that his grandmother had made the previous weekend, Trevor asked. What would happen if I swallowed a... He didn't say tadpole, because even going near the pond was a groundable offense. A live and squiggly thing. What? Like a tiny fish but not a fish. Like a worm? Yeah, except not a little swimmer. What the hell are you talking about, kid? Um, never mind. That night, Trevor went to bed early, turned off the lamp and clicked on his flashlight. He flipped through the pages of the magazine to the spread that enraptured him most. 
photos of a man putting a penis in his mouth. In some of the pictures, the man gazed at the penis like it was a holy object, like there was a tractor beam between the penis and the mouth. And then, on the next page, good Lord. The expression on the face of the man with the penis in his mouth was nothing compared to the expression of the man whose penis was doing the mouth stuffing. His expression suggested the experience was marvelous beyond words, and though Trevor would prefer to have seen Mindy, his beginnings of biology lab partner, having her mouth stuffed, it's not like a mouth was a boy part or a girl part. It was a people part. So what exactly was he feeling down there? What did it all mean? What did it all mean? Later, but apparently not late enough, Trevor discovered he was able to recreate the sensation he'd felt on the island, a sensation that he enhanced with touching and tugging and jerking, which created a spasmodic eruption of pleasure the likes of which Trevor had never experienced before. His leg twitched, and his right foot struck the table upon which the specimen jar sat. The tadpoles spilled across the bedroom floor, creating a mess Trevor ignored while he pondered what to do with the hot jizz that had splashed onto his belly, a mess he hadn't been the least bit prepared for. And that's how his father found him when he opened the bedroom door and snapped on the lights. His naked son sprawled on the bed with a gay porno magazine spread open, the odor of semen mixing with the stench of stagnant pond water, and dying tadpoles gasping for breath with gills that they didn't even have. Little swimmers would swim no more. His dad didn't say a word. He simply backed out of the room and shut the door. They never spoke of it again. The morning after Dallas's departure for Paris, Trevor met the next-door neighbor. He was entering the code for the exterior gate, thinking about what he was going to say to the zucchini when she came running down the hill, wearing short shorts and a tank top at least two sizes too small. Trevor couldn't tell if she was in her late 20s or early 30s, but her physique was impressive. Excuse me? Excuse me. Are you the new house sitter? Technically, he wasn't. He didn't even have keys to the house. Although the question raised more questions. New? Had there been another? As far as Trevor was concerned, there was only one thing to say to a woman in distress. Yes. I need your help, and I don't know who else to turn to. What's the matter? I've lost my fiefums. Your what? My cat. I've looked all over, and I think he might be in your yard. Would it be okay if I came up for a few seconds and called for him? Sometimes he gets scared and hides, and if he's not familiar with his surroundings, he'll just stay there. It'll only take 15 seconds, I swear. Sure. Trevor said this because this was a theme that had launched a thousand pornos. Thank you so, so much. Trevor opened the first gate, then the second, and stood by and watched Dallas's neighbor call for her cat for considerably longer than 15 seconds. They ended up in the corner where the giant zucchini lurked under the cover of its spade-shaped leaves. Leaves that appeared a tad lighter than they had the day before. Oh, beefums, the neighbor cried, and Trevor expected the cat to come crawling out from under the leaves. But instead, the neighbor collapsed on Trevor's shoulder. I don't know what I'm going to do. He's my only boy. Although this made no sense to Trevor, he was moved by the intensity of her feelings. It had been a while since Trevor had felt this way about anything. I'll keep an eye out for him. Trevor put his arms around her, feeling simultaneously aroused and ashamed of that arousal. Why did the two always have to go hand in hand? <laughs> I know you will. Trevor imagined he could feel the gourd judging him silently from the shadows. Trevor paced his bungalow apartment, unable to sleep. He'd cleaned his tiny studio. He was a compulsive neatnik, 
until it was spick and span, but he couldn't stop thinking about the gourd. All kinds of thoughts went through his head. Things he'd said to the zucchini during his last visit. Things he'd meant to say but had forgotten. Things that still needed to be said. He was considering turning on his laptop and composing his thoughts when Dallas called. There was a lot of noise on the other end of the line. Just checking in on the Sasquatch. Sas Sasquatch? Sasquatch. El Gordo, the great zucchini. Uh, right, right, yeah. Everything's fine. Uh, where are you? Swingers party. Don't get excited. There's some real woofers here. Some of these chicks are hairier than you. I, I met your neighbor. Carol? Crazy eyes, but total smoke show. Yeah, yeah, that would be her. Did she try to blow you? What? No, no. I, I helped her look for her cat. I bet you did. <laughs> How's Paris? Paris blows. You wouldn't believe how snooty these assholes are. But tell me something, T. When you said you helped Carol look for her cat, I hope you didn't let her in the garden. No. I'm going to break it down for you, Trevor. If Deborah found out you let that psycho anywhere near her zucchini, she'd have a shit fit like you wouldn't believe. I'd go so far as to say I don't think it's something our friendship could survive. Well, we can't have that. I'm super supremo serious about this, dude. Serious as cancer. Stage four cancer with the side of AIDS. Serious. You hearing me? I'm hearing you, but why? Uh, oh, shit. Deborah needs more lube. Ciao! Trevor went back to the garden at dawn. Even early in the morning, there was nowhere to park, so he left his car in his usual spot at the auto parts parking lot. Walking up the hill, he noticed more signs for lost pets. A Pomeranian and a Calico had joined the ranks of the disappeared. He entered the codes and went up to the garden. He checked the sprinkler system to make sure it was working. A series of three green lights, two solid and one blinking, told him that everything was as it should be. And he made his way to the zucchini. Hi, Gord. It's me, Trevor. As he entered the garden's gloom, he could see that something was wrong. Its once dark and lustrous leaves were now ashy and mottled with fungus. Sasquatch appeared to be in some kind of distress. While the gourd seemed to have grown substantially, its color had faded so that it more closely resembled a watermelon, though quadruple the size. It seemed to Trevor that the leaves shimmied as he stooped to inspect the plant. More zucchinis had begun to sprout along the vine, but he didn't see how this could cause the plant's leaves to whiten. Trevor went about plucking off the nubs, but they were tough and the nettles sharp. Jerking them free required considerable violence and no small degree of resolve. As if it didn't want to give up its offspring, he gave the last nub a final twist. <coughs> Trevor stopped. The garden went still. Was the gourd talking back to him? Or was there something else in the garden? Fifums, is that you? In the distance, a large vehicle rumbled and clanked, garbage truck engaging in intercourse with its bins. After enough time had passed to convince Trevor that he'd imagined the sound, he got up and washed his scratched, dirty hands with the garden hose. He walked down the hill to the parking lot, vaguely wondering if he ought to go back and take a few photos of the plant to send to Dallas. He found himself standing in the lot, staring dumbly at the spot where he thought he'd parked his car, trying to remember if he'd left it somewhere else. His thought these days were filled with gourds, and as the gourds in the garden grew, they crowded out everything else. Senor. An old brown-skinned man pushed a shopping cart his way. He wore a faded work shirt and a cowboy hat whose brim was hopelessly sweat-stained. They towed your truck. They come at sunrise like vultures. <sighs> Muchos gracias. He was having trouble coming to terms with the fact that his car was really gone. De nada. The old man replied with a smile that revealed a silver tooth gleaming in the morning light. You look like a man who works the earth. 
Is that right? It is. Mm, I have something for you. The man dug through his cart until he found what he was looking for. An old oil cloth that he unfolded to reveal a fearsome-looking machete. Sharp steel. Hmm? Good price. Uh, no. No, thank you. An uncharitable thought flashed through Trevor's head. Was this man hacking up the neighborhood pets with his machete? How about these work gloves? Worn, but sturdy. How much? Five dollars. I'll take them. While Trevor withdrew his wallet and extracted a five-dollar bill, the man smiled, showing even more silver. The man pulled out his smartphone and began tapping in numbers. Let me call the tow truck company for you. On the drive over back to the garden that evening, it occurred to him that he could talk to the zucchini the way he would talk to Dallas. Unlike his friend, the gourd wouldn't crack jokes or cut him off or treat him like an idiot. He could treat the zucchini as a stand-in for people he had trouble talking to, like Dallas or his dad, like everyone. As he approached the gate, he saw Carol. She stood in between an elder woman with sleek dark hair and a young man in mattress shorts and leather sandals. They all had their phones out and were primed for action. There he is! Trevor had spent most of the afternoon chasing down the driver who'd towed his car to find out which of the company's several yards his vehicle had been taken to. He was in no mood for the pet people of Echo Park. We think our pets are in your yard, and we want to have a look. Didn't we go through this yesterday? Under the circumstances, we think a more exhaustive search is in order. What circumstances would that be? A half a dozen pets have gone missing all in this neighborhood. Three more went missing this week, including... Including Beefums. I was here this morning. There are no pets here. Still, we'd like to have a look. If you could let us in to document the scene. I'm afraid I can't allow that. Trevor pulled on his work gloves. Now excuse me, I have work to do. Shielding the keypad so that the neighbors couldn't see the sequence of numbers... He found that he had to remove his gloves to punch in the code. That done, he slipped inside and pulled the gate shut with more violence than he intended, resulting in a nerve-jangling clang that startled him. Carol threw herself against the gate. Murderer! I want my beef-ups back! Trevor was so alarmed by her wild accusations, her wanton display of... Yes, he hated to admit it, but Dallas had been right. Psychosis... He fled and had to input the code for the second gate several times before he mastered the sequence. <sighs> El Gordo had grown considerably during Trevor's absence. The leaves that once shrouded the squash in vegetal gloom were no longer large enough to shade the gourd and were white and brittle with decay, exposing the swollen squash in a way that seemed almost indecent. The zucchini was growing so fast that its color was now several shades lighter, like the unripened rind of a melon mixed with the pearly translucence of a creature that made its home beneath the sea. What's the matter, big guy? Are you thirsty? Are you getting enough water? Tell me what's wrong. Did the cat lady upset you? It's okay. She upsets me too. Trevor searched the plant for new growths and the few he found he twisted off with the new force that the gloves allowed. The giant gourd, now the size of a coffee table, seemed to shift, as if to recoil from his aggression. What's this? Have you been hiding something from me? Trevor spied a zucchini he hadn't noticed before. It was eight inches long and grew from the offshoot pinned underneath the massive monster. Trevor wedged his body between the fence and the ground and tried to grasp the growth, but couldn't quite reach it. He inched forward, took hold of the zucchini, and snapped it off. The gourd shuddered and rolled, pinning Trevor to the fence. The zucchini he plucked must have served as a kind of wedge, and the gourd had shifted as he pulled it free. But now, the gourd kept pressing, 
like it wanted to smother him in the dirt or flatten him against the fence. With his face pressed against its rough and warty flesh, Trevor could hear something gurgling inside the gourd. A muffled cry as it pressed harder and harder. Is this really happening? Trevor thought as he shifted his weight and tried to push back. He didn't have much success. If anything, he lost more ground to the gourd. But he was able to work his arm free and strike the great zucchini with his fist. For a split second, the pressure relented and Trevor slipped free. The gourd crashed into the fence, splintering some of the boards and cracking the post. Trevor scrambled across the gravel, crushing who knows how many succulents, and waited by the hose until his breathing slowed and his mind stopped racing. He needed to talk to Dallas and find out what the hell was going on. He hauled out his phone and dialed the number. While the phone rang and rang, he tried to think of something coherent to say, but none of this made sense. Zucchinis don't move, and they sure as hell don't scream. They also weren't supposed to grow to the size of a living room furniture, so what the fuck? When he reached Dallas's voicemail, Trevor panted into the phone. It's not right. It's an abomination. It's, it's evil. At home, Trevor brewed a pot of calming tea that his sponsor had given him early in his sobriety. He'd claimed the tea possessed an extract used by ancient Mayans that allowed the imbiber to see clearly, to perceive things as they really are. It was bullshit, but Trevor drank the tea. The gourd was past the point of becoming a problem. It was a full-on threat to his safety, a menace. With the clarity of an after-school special, Trevor could see he'd been wrong and Carol had been right. She wasn't crazy. A little overly attached to her pet, perhaps, but clearly not insane. She knew there was something wrong with Deborah's garden. But did Deborah? Was this whole gourd sitting business an elaborate setup to lure him? A man with few emotional attachments... Someone nobody would miss. To her garden where he'd end up as fertilizer for that swollen monstrosity. <laughs> he wasn't concerned with what this said about Deborah and Dallas. Fuck them. But what did it say about him? This was what he'd gotten clean for? Fuck. Trevor emptied the pot and washed the cup. And when he was done, he dried them and put them back in the cabinet. He knew what needed to be done. Trevor waited in the auto parts parking lot for the man with the machete. He figured he'd offer $60 cash for the steel. $60 seemed like a fair price to rid the world of evil. He waited for most of the morning, and when the old man finally arrived, he didn't seem surprised to see Trevor. I'd like to buy that machete. Ah, senor, you're too late. I sold the machete yesterday. I wish it had been you, because this woman, she scared me a little. Beautiful lady, but crazy in the eyes. Do you know what I mean? I know what you mean. But I have something else for you. Trevor felt something like love for the old man as he fished out a box out of the bottom of the cart and made a great show out of opening it. I think this will help you with your job, senor. I think you're right. Trevor gave the man all the money he had in his wallet. The gourd looked ghostly white in the moonlight. 
It was now the size of a refrigerator. As Trevor approached, the gourd shuddered and began to emit a terrible high-pitched whine. The same sound he'd heard the day before, only louder. A vegetal scream that Trevor drowned out by firing up his new purchase. chainsaw started on the first pull with a belch of smoke that bathed Trevor in fumes, just as the old man had promised. Trevor crossed the gravel graveyard and straddled Sasquatch. He felt the gourd kick between his thighs as he lowered the teeth of the saw into its flesh. The creature's meat and seed and ichor burst from the body of the gourd, showering Trevor with zook gore. He moved the saw up and down with a precision he didn't know he possessed. His goal was to open the gourd, not smash it. He slid back and continued to cut until the incision was several feet long, like a slot on the back of a giant piggy bank. Dogs howled all over the neighborhood. He kicked the gourd, and when it didn't break, he returned to its center and tried to pry the two halves open. Though silent, Sasquatch hadn't given up the fight and clamped down on Trevor's hands like a jaw. It was weaker now, and little by little Trevor was able to rip the beast open until it gave way with an anguished moan and was rent in two. Inside the gourd, dozens of gelatinous pods of various sizes and shapes wriggled and squirmed, pink and purple pods laced with ropey strings of fibrous biomass, blighted with black spots, bathed in gordy goo. Some were the size of softballs, others as big as beer kegs. The larger ones knocked up against another, while the small shapes spasmed and twitched. They writhed with freakish potency. Trevor got down on his knees and tore the first pod open, and a small cat thrust its head out, mewling like mad. Fiefums? Trevor tore away the rest of the pod's sticky coat, and the cat shook off the remnants of its second birth. Trevor scooped up Fiefums and slid him inside his shirt, then went to work on the rest of the pods, tearing open the egg-like sacks with his hands, unleashing a pack of chihuahuas, a couple of feral cats, several nervous squirrels, and even a pit bull, who showed her thanks by showering Trevor with slobber, as joyful an expression of gratitude as he had experienced in his 30 years on the planet. Soon the yard was filled with yelping, mewling, barking creatures. They shook their bodies to rid themselves of their slumber. Trevor flung open the gates and let the animals escape. They all fled, except for the pit bull, who turned at what was left of the gourd and growled. Good girl. Trevor found the stalk where the gourd was connected to the plant and severed it with the saw. He doused the mess with gasoline from the garage and struck a match. The gourd roasted and burned. When the flames reached the height of the fence, Trevor turned the hose on the vegetable, and the yard filled with dense smoke until all that was left of the gourd was its collapsed rind, sodden and black. Walking up the hill with the cat nestled inside his shirt and the pit bull at his side, Trevor breathed in air that for the first time in days, wasn't heavy with the stench of something scummy and shameful, but something rich and aromatic, something wonderful. When he reached Carol's yard, he had it. The neighborhood was perfumed with the unmistakable scent of zucchini bread.
<laughs> well, great. Now I want zucchini bread. I know. That's great because our sponsor <laughs> comes from Zucchini International. <laughs> zucchini, America's oh. favorite gourd. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Justin and Jennifer. Welcome back, Scott. Uh, welcome, Dallas. So happy to have you join us. Thank you so much. Um, Want to just do a short question and answer period with everybody. Would love to just hear a little bit more about this uh, this process, all of the, the things. Um, I know the name is right there, but want to do a formal introduction to Dallas McLaughlin, who is one of the voices that we heard in this production. Thank you so much. Fantastic job, Dallas. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So we'll start with you. Um, is this a character that you felt like you could relate to at all? Uh, well, you know, there are some parts uh, that were definitely a little close to home. And uh, and probably would get me kicked out of a normal home, but other parts, um, yeah, I never killed any any living like alien gourd before, um, but I am willing to give it a try if somebody out there is willing to pay me. I am an artist. You let me go for it. I mean, art imitates life. Life imitates art. Like yeah. who knows where that saying really began? It's like the chicken and the fucking egg. Like who knows, right? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like this has also really prepared you for um, a role as Seymour in Little Shop of Horrors, if anybody is looking. It's the role I've always wanted to play. Um, I can fake wearing glasses with the best of them. Bring it on. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> for any other casting directors out there, Alex <laughs> is ready. He is prepared for the role. Yeah. Um, Justin and Jennifer, uh, would love to kick to you. I think that we've talked about this before in previous episodes, um, but would love to just hear about taking this series, Black Candies, this book series, um, and what made you want to turn it into a uh, a radio play series? Oh my goodness, money. Yeah, I'll take it first. So um, I've always loved radio plays unabashedly, unironically loved uh, War of the Worlds. But there's a personal story that every artist out there will feel, and it's this. I, w I was in college. Right? Thanks, Mom, for putting up with that. Great financial decision on my part. And um, I had written this play for the radio inspired by Radiohead's album Kid A. And it got a couple showings in New York City. And then two months after the deadline to submit, I discovered that the BBC was having a contest for radio plays inspired by Radiohead songs. No way. And I felt, no way. I, felt, I felt like I don't know what I had done in a past life to have that ripped from my grasp but I've always wanted to get back into the medium or get into the medium for the first time. And so this opportunity was just wonderful and having now at this stage in our lives, the resources to do it because I had no idea, even having worked in stage theater, just how much more work it is to bring it to the audio experience. Yeah, and personally, I uh, have always loved um, literary horror. I'm not much for like slash and, and torture and quick edit kind of horror or horror film, but I really like literary horror. And um, and then I really am interested in radio work and radio plays. And then the timing kind of worked out really, really well because um, when COVID came around, then this seemed like a good time to try to do this even though it didn't always work out really great with trying to get actors together and everything. We certainly had to do the social distancing thing and work out what we could, but uh, it was a good time to try to do it this way instead of, you know, mount a play on stage with audiences and everything. So, um, so yeah, this, uh, we just, we went all for it and experimented and we loved the way everything turned out. It's just something so special to about radio because it's just so intimate. And usually when someone's speaking, Low, and I wish we had Victor Morris here, our narrator, who could just read the phone book and I just pay him to keep reading like a talk line. It's just such dulcet tones that usually when that's happening to you, something good is happening to you. So it's an experience you can't quite get in any other medium. Absolutely, absolutely. And Dallas, what about for you? Um, uh, going into this process, again, that it's not 
Uh, that it's, it's moving from that acting with our entire bodies and using our entire instrument to just going down to your voice, but then also doing this in the time of COVID. Can you talk yeah. about what that process was like from the actor standpoint? Well, yeah, well, oddly enough, I had written a musical about Radiohead's The Bins, and uh, it was a lot, I'm just kidding, I'm just totally kidding. Um, <laughs> I was like, this is such a Radiohead crew. <laughs> uh, no, I, I actually have had the pleasure to do voice work for a number of years for some television shows. Uh, uh, there's a show called Yo Gabba Gabba, that's a kid's show that I did. Uh, a lot of voices for, and I love it. I mean, I honestly going into the studio, yeah, I went in with Justin, and uh, it's just fun, like being in a room with somebody and trying to make that one person enjoy what you're doing is a whole new challenge. But uh, at times, it's a lot more fun because you don't have, like, you're not beholden. If I'm on stage, I can't mess around. I got to do the show. But in a room alone with Justin, we can both take off our pants and we can just get comfortable and have a good time. Great. Now, I would love to know how much of this recording was done pantsless. I would that say. That really brings us to a great question. 99.9%. <laughs> Don't ask. And you just gave me a lot of really percent. cool. <laughs> What's that, Justin? So don't ask what the 0.1% was that remained on. We actually do have another uh, recording for an upcoming episode wherein one of our actors did uh, take his shirt off. That's an ongoing joke among the Listen with the Lights Off crew because he felt more comfortable and more in character taking his shirt off. <laughs> yeah, just because you're working in radio, you can't get away from method actors being method actors. <laughs> hey, you got to do what you got to do to find that character. Um, and, yeah. and speaking of, Dallas, what was it like? For, I mean, was there anything that you had to draw from or anything special that you did to prepare for this role? Uh, I mean, nothing special in, in the sense that, uh, you know, I got to pretty much play myself. I, you know, I, I didn't do any kind of voices for this. It was strange reading a script where somebody was named Dallas and I wasn't saying those words. Um, but it was, uh, it was fun to just go in, I think. And, um, you I mean, you mentioned COVID, a lot of artists had nothing to do. We had zero to do <laughs> for months and months and months. Still people, you know, theater, uh, actors and, and employees of all degrees are out of work. Um, so really I just wanted to give it my all, if that sounds as ridiculous and cheesy as possible, but. I just wanted to go in and have fun. I mean, this was one of the few performance opportunities I had, uh, especially back in the first, I mean, what this was, if I'm not wrong, the first like two, three months of the coronavirus that we recorded this. So like, we were all just sitting around twiddling thumbs like, well, this will be over next week. It's fine. Uh, so this was a, a, good, a fun opportunity to go in and just try to tr really try to knock it out of the park and then tell Justin and then have Justin tell me to just quiet down a little bit, stop peeking. Absolutely. Which is very nice. We say also decided it, was, it would be a good move to record in a hot, uh, soundproof room with no air conditioning in the dead of summer. Yeah. So that was yeah. a really great creative choice we all made together. <laughs> well, then it also explains the pantsless, shirtless yeah. recording. There you go. There you Absolutely. go. Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, I do believe that we have a couple of questions from our audience. Um, can you tell us some more about how you come up with your drink pairings, <laughs> Jennifer and Justin? Uh, well, for this episode, um, we, mainly, I'll just show it here, mainly we wanted a green drink. I think it kind of comes off yellowish on camera here, but we wanted a, a green drink and something that maybe incorporated something in the Gord family. And so Justin found this recipe. We, we found a lot of recipes, but a lot of them were very complicated. So we wanted something simple. And Justin found this one. And, and uh, yeah. We adapted it up. Yeah, I used to bartend briefly. And um, despite all of the fancy drinks out there, most drinks people order are just like a hard liquor and a mixer. And so we just we made it fancy by adding two mixers. And then the one that we had for the other listening part, um, that was uh, that came Mia. From that came from yeah. La Jolla Playhouse from Mia. And, the pumpkin beer. Yeah, which mm -hmm. was so good. And uh, that one, again, we wanted something kind of simple. Um, and that, that was one of her favorites. And we loved that drink. And it was something that 
had a pumpkin ale incorporated because it was around Halloween. So yeah, that's uh, yeah, we wanted something that just kind of reflects the mood or the season and the uh, also kind of the tone of the piece. Still on theme with the gourd. We probably could have gotten away with repeating the pumpkin drink because it's still in that gourd family. But I'm glad yeah, that we went cool. with the uh, the the less respected, the less known gourd, the cucumber. Uh, Jason, do we have another question from the audience? Dallas, okay, knowing your voiceover work, what is the strangest voice you've ever had to do? Oh gosh, that's a fun question. Um, I, I'd love to say my dad, but that's not true. Um, I think the I think probably the strangest voice I ever had to do was uh, we we <laughs> a long time ago we did uh, for the this show called the Aquabat Super Show. Right, it was a big, huge, giant robot monster, and I had to growl like the whole thing was just growling. Like they basically they told me like pretend like you just ate a bunch of rocks and then don't swallow and talk, and finding it was the hardest and sh weirdest thing I've ever done. I couldn't do it again now, uh, but I, I lost my voice for, I think like two weeks after we did the recording, cause it would just trashed my throat. Um, but I got paid like 300 bucks, so worth it. <laughs> wow, so much respect to all those growlers that yeah. we hear in any of the zombie that uh what is the show that i can't bring myself to watch because everybody just dies anyway the walking dead yeah. like yeah res much respect for the uh, it's hard it's exes. hard work it's hard work. it is it is respect and i have to tell you dallas you just got me major cool auntie points knowing that you were on yo gaba gaba my <laughs> nieces are all grown now but uh -huh. that was a huge part of our lives for that, a very long time thank god thank god there was two people that watched <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, we have another question. Um, Scott, this one is for you, sir. A big fan of your work. Tim Shaw is a big fan of your work. And just can you talk a little bit about the musical process, how you create the sounds and the soundscape that you do? Well, for these plays, I would read them and... Can you step closer to the laptop? <laughs> so for these plays, I... do. I'd read them and try to pick one or two instruments that act as uh, a, a narrator in a way or to underscore a narrator. And uh, sometimes it's obvious what you need to pick. You know, if it's super sci-fi, you got to have theremin. Um, and if it's uh, very sort of heavenly, got to have harp. And fortunately, got plenty of those. Uh, and, and it's nice to listen to the main actors and get inspired by their voices. You know, some people sound like a beautiful bassoon or a wonderful bass clarinet. And, and you know, that'd be, you know, it'd be wonderful to sometime pair Dallas with a, with a bass clarinet. That'd be great some, sometime for some, some show. But then um, a lot of times it's just what I happen to have. Like this is a normal kazoo, but I put this special microphone inside it and put it through a processor. And that's how I did all of the, monster whales uh, in, in the, the recent play. And then uh, in some of the scenes where all of the plants were growing quite violently, um, I had this uh, Viber slap, which uh, the, this is a modern version of Jawbone of the Ass. Remember the old days when you could buy this sort of like horse uh, skeleton head and you would slap a cheek and all the teeth would rattle? I know you remember that, Jacole. I know you bought them before. and uh, But this is the modern version of that. And it's obviously, I do go through the script to see what some of the more obvious sound effects should be. Uh, uh, like, you know, if there were some scenes where chains were being hoisted, and so this uh, professional quality ratchet does the trick. But it's also fun just to do the more subtle things. And I have a favorite favorite slide whistle that can do a teapot. So that was a delightful opportunity to get some more value out of my dollar ninety nine slide whistle. But then, you know, it's also nice to have a ten thousand dollar harp, you know. And per pound, that harp was a good buy because it weighs a ton. <laughs> 
How what is what is the poundage of the harp? Just so that we can again give you the full props that you deserve for getting that into Justin and Jennifer's place. Well, it's just a three-quarter size harp. That's what a rich kid gets when they learn to play harp. But I put it up on a little dolly so it looks full size. Uh, so I mean it's less than a hundred pounds, but it feels like so much more when you're lugging it around. That's for sure. Absolutely. So and Scott, we're gonna get to hear so much more from you. We will get to hear uh, don't marry a harpist, everybody. Words of the wise. <laughs> Words to live by. <laughs> and I, I am fully expecting at some point in the future to get a uh, one-person show of Peter and the Wolf going with everything that you have there. That's that's my dream. Um, but we are going to hear much more from you, Scott, as we are uh, finishing out this broadcast. But I believe we have one more question from the audience. One of my favorite people in the world, Travis Gus. Uh, he says it was very wonderful. Have you found through the pandemic that your creativity is stronger? Has there been a strange perk of the pand a strange perk of the pandemic has been such great work that has come out of it? Especially, I just want to say personally, I feel so good that uh, we have been able to give opportunities through our Digital Wow series to so many artists to be able to create during this pandemic. Um, but I would love to give all of you a chance to answer that. Uh, how has the pandemic affected your level of creativity? Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Please. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it's just, I, I mean, and I, I know Justin and, and Jennifer will completely agree with this, but I think it's forced everyone to think outside the box. Uh, and for me, I was working, you know, in an industry theater that uh, shut down. So it was, you know, all of a sudden you weren't out of, you were out of a job. And so it kind of became, how do we, not necessarily how do you make the revenue up because that probably wasn't gonna happen, but how do you not sit on your butt and just get drunk every day? Still did plenty of that. But, uh, you know, I made, uh, I, I ended up making a, a web series with my seven-year-old daughter, a uh, cooking show. Uh, which we would have never done before, you know, if she wasn't home from school and I wasn't not working, it, you know. So it was those things of like, hey, how can I just jump in and, and do things uh, with my family, uh, with the things that are at my disposal? I wrote a ton more than I've ever done in my life, uh, which was great. So I, I think it was, I think the first couple of months for most people, it was sitting around getting drunk. And then as it went on, it was like, Hey, let's try something. Uh, this is getting boring, <laughs> and I might die. My liver looks terrible, uh, so I think it just pushed me, and I hope it pushed everybody. I mean, it's been it's been an interesting time, and a really really wonderful time for creativity. I think. Down slim, Justin. Yeah. More. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I wish I could say that that. I have written a lot more, but no. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think, as so say we all, uh, we've we've done a lot that that actually we've been wanting to do for a long time, and COVID just kind of forced our hand into doing it, which is um, doing a lot of digital pivots. Um, so we had to take our damp showcase online, our long story short show online and um yeah so we've just had to do that and communicate digitally a lot more and um so while our uh you know finances may have taken a hit we have had to like dallas said think out of the box and, and grow creatively and think of other ways alternative ways to reach people and do things and expand our programming that way uh, we started So Say We All TV, so uh, and that's like a variety show kind of thing where people can send in videos or cartoons, um, stand-up segments, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think we've, we've grown a bit through that. Yeah, I, as I'm sure everybody in, in San Diego who goes to the theater knows, there's, it's, there, there's not a lot of live venues already before the pandemic in San Diego. And um, we have very weird, this may not be common knowledge, but it definitely is to smaller companies and performers, but we have some very, very incredibly strict and asinine laws, cabaret laws that prevent live entertainment in venues that serve food and beverages. It's archaic, it's dated in the 90s, no one wants to change it. And so we already were faced with a very limited amount of options. And so this kind of, like Jennifer said, just forced us to do what we already saw the writing on the wall was, which is, 
go digital and get out of San Diego with our scope so that we're not just kind of bound to what we can get away with here under the eye of the, you know, SDTD zoning laws. Well, I have to say, as one of our longest partners, one of our favorite partners, we're so glad that we were able to make the shift with you all to be able to continue to work in this capacity, to be able to continue to partner, to be able to continue to tell stories in this digital capacity. And I'm also grateful for the Playhouse for keeping me employed because that's the only thing that kept the day drinking at bay, like <laughs> the only thing. So my liver sure, thanks me. you. <laughs> Um, I and so I think my final question is, uh, what's your favorite gourd? Uh, I wanted us uh, to have a whole contest, like have show us your gourd and have the audience like send in pictures of their giant gourds. But the Hoya Playhouse <laughs> said that I can't do that, and I should probably stop talking about it so that I can stay employed tomorrow because actually the uh, promotion doesn't kick in until tomorrow. So uh, I'm just going to stop there. But, uh, but what's your favorite gourd? Up, really sensitive subject matter in the photos. I understand. Exactly. That's what I was told. Does spaghetti squash count? Absolutely it spaghetti does. Squash. Multifunctional gourd. Mm. Yes, Scott. Yeah. I, uh, uh, my grandma, my grandmother-in-law makes art out of gourds, out of dried gourds or whatever they are. So I think I have to legally say those are my favorite gourds, anything that she creates. Yes. Well done, well done, shout out to grandma. All right, Justin, Jennifer? I think uh, maybe butternut squash, if that's, if that counts, I think so. Very hearty gourd, like absolutely it. counts as a gourd. Don't Justin. anybody send pictures of their butternuts? Yeah, I'm surprised that I have a ready answer for this. It's called a swan neck gourd. And I invite anybody to Google it because it clearly will demonstrate that, that squashes will evolve to overtake us all one day. And they're more beautiful in the process. And with that, I am going to refrain to answer the question so that I keep my job tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much, Justin and Jennifer. So say we all. Thank you so much, Dallas, for joining us. Thank you, Scott. And why don't you take us home? Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Thank you.